This morning, our pastor will be preaching and teaching from Luke chapter 17, beginning with verse 11 through 19. Luke 17, beginning with verse 11. If you're physically able, would you please stand out of respect for the reading of God's word? Luke 17. And it came to pass, as he went to Jerusalem, that he passed through the midst of Samaria and Galilee. And as he entered into a certain village, there met him ten men that were lepers, which stood afar off. And they lifted up their voices and said, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. And when he saw them, he said unto them, Go show yourselves unto the priests. And as it came to pass, that as they went... They were cleansed, and one of them, when he saw that he was healed, turned back and with a loud voice glorified God and fell down on his face at his feet, giving him thanks, and he was a Samaritan. And Jesus answering said, Were there not ten cleansed? But where are the nine? There are not found that return to give glory to God, save this stranger, And he said unto him, Arise, go thy way, thy faith hath made thee whole. May the reading of God's word touch our heart today. Thank you. You may be seated. Take a little step away from the life of David here this morning and focus on a story that um, I think for me as a boy growing up, I most associated with Thanksgiving. It's one that I often heard told and uh, one that I want to speak to you about here today. Uh, You might be familiar, if if you know uh, much literature history, uh, with the name Rudyard Kipling. Uh, He wrote the classic known as uh, The Jungle Book, uh, which of course uh, was a book. A lot of kids may think it's just a movie, but uh, it was a book first. And uh, he became a popular author. He grew up and spent a good amount of time in India and writing about those things, not just in books, but also poetry, uh, poems such as uh, Gunga Dean and uh, If, uh, I believe one also called Mandalay, and, and so a lot of writing. Well, in 1880, 1892, excuse me, he became at that stage so popular that uh, Alfred Lord Tennyson, who had passed away, uh, at, at this point, Rudyard Kipling kind of took his place. And so in popular estimation, he was the greatest living poet and writer as far as the English people were uh, concerned, Rudyard Kipling. I read that in his heyday, every word that Rudyard Kipling wrote was worth 25 shillings. And uh, upon hearing this, a group of college students got together and they sent him a letter. And uh, they wrote to him and said, we understand that every word you write is worth 25 shillings. Enclosed is 25 shillings. Please send us your best word. They sent it off. Well, a couple of days later, the students received an envelope, and in it was a one-word reply from Rudyard Kipling, and the one word was this, thanks. (laughs) And that response is certainly humorous, but also weighty. Thanks is truly a powerful word. Our Lord demands of His followers, in everything, give thanks. This is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you, that we would be a thankful people. In fact, it's interesting, we're told in the book of Romans, in the fall of societies into paganism, that where it starts is that when they knew God, they glorified Him not as God, neither were thankful. And the whole downward spiral of society follows. I think a lack of thanks is part of what causes marriages and homes to crumble, is people don't have gratitude and thanksgiving anymore in their spouse and in their loved ones. We see in, in uh, 2 Timothy chapter number 3 that it's a characteristic of the last days and part of the perilous times that people would be unthankful and unholy. So we're a people that ought to give thanks. If we are right with God, if we are in right standing with God, then thanksgiving will be a regular part of our life. 
Giving thanks isn't just for the Christians something that we do on one day out of the year. It's a life that we live. Giving thanks in our prayers continually. Again, we're told in the book of Thessalonians to rejoice evermore. Well, how can we have such a a spirit of thanksgiving? Where can we find within ourselves such a heart that wants to and is able, not just something contrived, but to be able to give thanks continually in a true thanksgiving spirit? In Luke chapter 17, I, I think we find an explanation. I think we find the story of one who, in meeting Jesus Christ, had a life transformed. And Thanksgiving didn't become just a day on the calendar, but it became every day because he had met Jesus and change came. And so for us this morning, I want us to consider the thanksgiving of one made whole. And that's the message I want to speak to you today and hope that it's a challenge to you in your life. And I hope it's a challenge to me and mine. Let's begin with prayer as we get into the word of God together. Father, we thank you for these moments. We ask, Lord, that you would meet with us. Fill me with your spirit, Lord. I I pray that through your word, Lord, that you would search us and know us, that you would try us, that you would speak to us. Lord, reveal our heart. Are we a thankful people? I pray, Father, that uh, as you you search our hearts, that you would reveal to us those those, uh, ungrateful ways that are in us. Lord, that you would also search the hearts that don't know you and, and reveal that to them today, that they can't give thanks for the greatest reason because they haven't found so great salvation in Jesus Christ. Lord, I pray that you would just use these moments to the needs that each of us have. Lord, make us a thankful people. Make it a way of life. Make it, make it who we are, that we would live in gratitude, that it would be something that is demonstrated by our life and by our lips day by day. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. The first thing I have is to note in Luke chapter 17, in this story that we read just a moment ago with Brother Joe, is a cry that was made. You find it in verse number 12, as Jesus enters into a village, ten men that were lepers stood afar off and lifted up their voices. They're crying out, crying out to Jesus, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. So we're met right away in verse number 12 with the problem that these men had. And it tells us directly in verse 12 that there were ten men that were lepers. And that means they, of course, had the disease of leprosy. This was the the most fearsome disease in the world in the time of Christ. Just as today we hate uh, when we hear of a loved one or we fear in our own selves to to think we might hear the word cancer. Uh, So in that day to hear the declaration leprosy uh, was the dreaded thing. You you didn't want to hear it. it. It was something that had no cure. It would be as though you were diagnosed with cancer and told right off that you had terminal cancer. That there was no hope, no surgery, no chemo, no radiation, nothing could cure the cancer. But rather, as you're diagnosed with that leprosy, with that which would eat away at the exterior of your body until it finally got enough of you to kill you, it was simply a diagnosis that your end was on the horizon. And it's not just that having leprosy, that that you had, uh, that this highly contagious disease was on you, but it was also because of its being so contagious, something that meant you had to dwell the rest of your life in isolation. The job that you held was immediately canceled. You're immediately unemployed. The home that you had was immediately left. The relationships you'd enjoyed with your wife, with your children, could no longer continue because you did not want them to contract that same disease because, again, it meant certain death. And as a result, the lepers would have to leave the village, the community, the city that they inhabited and go outside to a leper colony, a society made up of the dying, of only suffering people. It's interesting, verse number 12, we're not told anything else about these men than the simple fact that they were lepers. We're not told whether they had been kings or shepherds, whether they had been captains in the army or businessmen. Ultimately, because they had contracted leprosy, that leprosy now defined them. The rest of what they had and what they've been was totally lost in that leprosy. 
It's interesting, when you study the Old Testament, you come across a leper by the name of Naaman, and it tells us in 2 Kings chapter 5 of all of his accomplishments, of all of his deeds, and then it's wrapped up in this one two-word phrase. It says, uh, I'm sorry, not two words, I can't count, but he was a leper, but leprosy. It erased everything else. It defined him. And that's what these men were facing. We notice their problem. We also see their position. It says in verse number 12, even as Jesus passed by in verse 12, as these 10 men that were lepers met him, it says they stood afar off. They stood back. In that, in that uh, time frame, when you had leprosy, you were forced and compelled by law to declare it so that nobody would get near to you. And you would shout out, unclean, unclean. I had a little bit of that experience when I was diagnosed with COVID back in 2020. And I remember being ostracized from my family and home. And, and uh, I remember some of the folks in the church that made meals for me. Uh, one, one time I went to a home, I, I could get in the car and drive. And, and they had placed the food at the end of the driveway. And so I arrived, and we're there in the car, and I get out, and I see them looking out the window, waving, and I wave in the distance, unclean, thank you, all right? And I grabbed it, and I left. Thankfully, it was only a 10-day isolation, right? But we got a little taste of that, but that was these men. There was no relationship. There was no being a part of community. Their position was afar off. And interestingly enough, under the misery and the pain of leprosy, unlikely companions and alliances sprung up. In fact, we find in verse 16 that the one that gave thanks to Jesus was a Samaritan. Normally, the Jews would have nothing to do with Samaritans. But here at this stage, when they all are in that same boat, in the same shape, facing that same dreaded outcome, they had just simply come together, and all of those other differences were lost. Now, the thing in all of it, if you know the Word of God, then you know that leprosy is a picture. It's a picture in the Old Testament, a picture in the New Testament. And leprosy is a picture of sin. It's what what it pictures. Leprosy affects the outward man, but, but sin affects the soul. Sin is something much more serious than leprosy. And sin is, sin is something that is a leprosy that impacts us all. We're told in the book of James that every man is drawn away of his own lust and enticed. And then when lust hath conceived, it bringeth forth sin. And sin, when it's finished, bringeth forth death. Just as leprosy meant there would be certain death in that society, so sin is what brings about certain death in you and I's life. I could ask you today, uh, how many out of 10 people like Coke versus Pepsi? You might say, well, five out of 10, six out of 10. I could say, how many out of 10 people today are going to have brown hair in this auditorium? You know, know, three out of 10, whatever. But if I ask you today, how many out of 10 people are going to die one day? The answer is 10 out of 10. It's appointed unto man once to die and after this, the judgment. And the reason that we all face death is because we're all sinners. Sin entered into the world with Adam and Eve, and we're born into sin, and we live in a sin-cursed world, and, and we have not only this physical death that we face, but also spiritual and eternal death, the second death, which is eternity in a lake of fire. The Word of God warns us the wages of sin is death. Sin, like leprosy, costs you everything. It goes beyond what it costs you in this life. It destroys both your body and your soul in hell. Sin overrides everything else that you may have been or accomplished. Because the Bible says if we could keep the whole law and yet offend in just one point, we're still guilty of it all. You might say, well, I, I've done this act of righteousness. I, I've been a part of a church for 50 years. I, I was baptized. I did X number of good things. My neighbors would count me as a good person. And yet all of that is nullified by this. You're a sinner in the sight of a holy God. And there is none that doeth good, not even one. Sin separates us from God. Just as these lepers could not approach Jesus Christ, so those in sin cannot come near to God. 
The Word of God says your iniquities and your sins hide God's face from you so that He will not even hear you. It brings the wrath of God rather than the grace of God to rest upon you. And again, this position of of being a, a spiritual leper is shared by all. We're all joined together, even with those that we despise the most. So often in our minds, we, we classify, here's the, the real wicked sinners. I'm not like them. No, no, we're all like them. We all belong to the same class of people. We all belong to that same group. As the Bible says, all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. There's no middle ground. It's not the sinner and the saint and the in-betweeners. We're all sinners, period. That's everybody. In that position, like the Apostle Paul, we must see our guilt, we must see our sin as an unholy, condemning thing. But you'll notice in this passage what the lepers do, because this is key. In their condition, they cried out to Jesus. In verse 13, they said, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. Notice their plea. They'd heard of Jesus Christ. They'd heard of His power. They'd heard of His miracles. In fact, He's already healed a leper by this point in time in Luke 17. And and there's hope within them that maybe Jesus can do something about our condition. And, And so when they see Him, they cry out, Jesus, that is Savior, Master. Again, He is our Savior. He is our Lord. And and no doubt as they see Him, as they cry out, there's an urgency in it. How long do these men have? How advanced is their leprosy? Clearly, they're able to move to a certain extent. They're not yet on their deathbed, but they can see it coming. Some may have been diagnosed for a few months. Some perhaps have had this leprosy for a year. Maybe some now have already lost some of the extremities on their face and and, and maybe some fingers, and they're crying out, you know, Lord Jesus, now! We need you now! Help! Jesus is passing by. The opportunity was here. And again, for you, if you saw yourself in in a leprous condition and Jesus passing by and you said, this is my chance for restoration. This is my chance for cleansing. It's only right now. Then then what's the natural response? Jesus, please. Oh, that we would see ourselves in sin. And in that sin, see the urgency as Jesus passes by Because now is the accepted time, and now is the day of salvation. If you see your sin, Jesus is the Savior. He's the Lord. He's the only one that can cleanse you of that spiritual leprosy of sin. And even today, see, this is the opportunity. Jesus passes by and cry out, Lord, save me. Cleanse me. We see their plea. The word of God warns, seek ye the Lord while he may be found. Call ye upon him while he is near. If he moves on your heart today, today if you hear his voice, harden not your heart, but rather humble yourself and in faith receive the gift of life made possible through Jesus. Notice in this passage, not only the cry, but also the second thing, the command. The Bible says in verse number 14, when Jesus saw them, and again, in, in the stories of Jesus' healings, he, he often does things different. And this is different than the other times he healed a leprous individual. Here, he simply gives them a command. He says, go and show yourselves unto the priests. And that day, in that society, if you had been declared leprous, in order for you to be declared clean, you had to get to, get to the priest, and the priest had to give you that, that clean bill of health, so to speak. Clean, free of leprosy. And so Jesus is telling them to go. Of course, when they go, when he tells them to do it, they still have their leprosy. Right? Go show yourselves the priest. They were not immediately cleansed at this point. Instead, we see Jesus demanded faith. Look at what it says in verse 14. It came to pass that as they went, they were cleansed. As they went, they had to act in faith 
before they could receive what they desired. They had to go to the priest, though at the first step they were yet uncleansed. They had to trust Christ's word and trust his grace and trust his power. It may not have been the way that they expected Jesus to operate. Maybe they would have expected that as they cried out that Jesus right there would simply cleanse them. Maybe they thought he would come and lay his hands on them. Maybe they thought that like what Elisha had Naaman do, that Jesus would tell them to go dip in the Jordan River seven times. Maybe even knowing that story, they'd done it before. But Jesus here acts in a unique way, and he says, go show yourself to the priest. Again, they could look at their hands as they get that command. They could look at their feet. They could look at one another, and they could see when they, when Jesus said, go show yourself to the priest, they still had their leprosy. So why am I going to go to the priest? And the answer is, only if you believe. They had to believe what Jesus told them to do. And that somehow, some way, that Jesus in his power and in his grace would heal them. And so, they went. And as their action expressed faith that Jesus was healing them, the Bible tells us in verse number 14, they were cleansed. Believing. They received the cleansing that they desired. You know, so it is for us today. We're saved by grace through faith. And it's a faith that responds to what Jesus Christ has called us to do, and that is believe on him. We're told in Romans chapter 10 and verse number 9, that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. Too many people fill up their mind with the head knowledge of Jesus, and yet they've never responded by faith. Lord, cleanse me, I believe. It's only as we respond by faith that we receive the cleansing of the sin that plagues our soul and our life. It's only then that we're made right with God. Again, we see in this passage how the skeptic would never have received cleansing. Remember when Naaman was told to go and dip seven times in the Jordan River? Do you remember how Naaman responded? He said, what? (laughs) Dip in a river seven times? That muddy river? What's that? What good's that going to do? And he got furious and angry with Elisha's servant who had brought that message from Elisha and given him that instruction. And, and in his unbelief and in his pride and in his arrogance, he almost missed the cleansing. Thankfully, he had a servant that was nearby and said, Hey, name it. What if, if he would have asked you to do some noble effort and some noble deed, then you would have done it. He's asked you to go and dip in the river. You can do that, right? And Naaman said, okay. And he went down to the river. And when he acted in accordance with the demand, you see Naaman healed. Too many are skeptical. Too many miss the healing because they will not believe. Hear again the words of the Apostle Paul when in urgency a jailer cried out, what must I do to be saved? What must I do to be rescued from the sin that's in my life? And Paul said clearly, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. And so it is today. You want deliverance from your sin, from its penalty, from its power, and one day from the very presence of sin, then believe on Jesus Christ. He died for you. He rose again again, that you might have life believing you will be saved. Notice the third thing in this passage. The Bible tells us of a cleansing and a completion. Again, in verse number 14, it came to pass as they went, they were cleansed. It was all by God's grace. It wasn't something that they earned. It's something, not something they worked for. It was merely because of Christ's promise, his power, his compassion, that they were cleansed. We notice the one that came back in verse number 19, and we see at the conclusion, not only did he receive the cleansing of his body, but notice these words that Jesus spoke to him. Arise, go thy way, thy faith hath made thee whole, complete. For this one that came back, while ten received physical healing, one was made fully whole. Because he came to Jesus, not just so Jesus would put back his physical life together, but he came back and honored Jesus as Lord. In fact, the Bible tells us in verse number 16, he falls on his face at his feet, giving him thanks. We see his act of worship. And so we find in his life that he is made complete. 
I would say again, we notice in those words, thy faith hath made thee whole. It is through faith that we are saved and salvation does make us whole. The Bible says in the book of, Eph of Colossians that we are complete in Jesus Christ. Complete. There's nothing lacking. When you trust Christ, you receive all of life. Jesus himself is life. You receive Christ, you receive forgiveness. You receive the Spirit of God to dwell within you. When you receive Jesus Christ, you receive peace from God and peace with God. In Jesus Christ, you receive the joy of the Lord within your soul. When you receive Jesus Christ, you are whole. You're complete. It's all in Him. We're justified, sanctified, glorified freely by His grace. Now notice in this passage, because we're going to get to the meat of this now, and that is the contrast. A contrast in the response and that's what always stands out about this story. We notice here the one. In verse 15, it says again, verse 14, it came to pass as they went, they were cleansed. Now, I don't know about you, but my mind is this. Jesus, as they cry out, Lord, have compassion, heal us. And Jesus says, go show yourself to the priest. And so I, I think the 10 of them probably kind of looking, maybe just at first kind of started, Are you guys going to go? Are we going to go? You know, and Maybe they all kind of start walking together and, and then they're like, well, let's go. And you can imagine some kind of picking up the pace and, and maybe, you know, even starting to run. And, and as they're going, I don't know if they saw it on themselves first. Maybe it was somebody to their side or, or, or somebody's like, what do you think? What do you think is going to happen? And maybe they look over and all of a sudden there's a fully formed nose again. All of a sudden, where there had been the white of the leprosy that was eating away at their skin, it's gone, and, and they're clean. And they're running, and they're like, look! And they look at their own hands, and, and suddenly all this excitement is in them. Look! And, and they're taking the bandages off, and they're finding they're healed. And the, the joy that must have just, the unbelief in the sense that, that they have what they long for is theirs. And as they're all there, I can imagine this group of 10 of them just maybe jumping up together, you know, and, and hugging one another and, and just like screaming out, look! And they're so excited to get back to the priest, they can get back to their family and back to their home. But as they start to go, one of them's like, but guys. <laughs> and the others just run off and he's there and he's not going to miss this chance. I don't know how far they had gone, but he runs back to Jesus. And notice what the Bible tells us. In verse number 15, one of them, when he saw that he was healed, turned back and with a loud voice glorified God. Now, I don't know whether this leper ever celebrated a day called Thanksgiving Day. Most likely not. I don't know whether he ever had turkey dinner with stuffing and potatoes and pumpkin pie. Again, most likely not. But I do know this, one day he met Jesus, and after that day, every day was Thanksgiving Day. Every day was a cause to rejoice and be exceeding glad. Every day, and in everything, he could give thanks. And it's interesting, when it says that he cried out with that loud voice, that word loud in the Greek is the Greek word mega. A mega voice. And you could just, I mean, it doesn't tell us what he exactly yelled. He just cries out. And I, and I just, in my mind, you know, there's so many words that would come to your mind, right? Of what this man might have done after all that he was experiencing and, and all the heartbreak. And, and now he's healed and he's going back to Jesus. What would you say? Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. And he's just shouting. I imagine Jesus, of course, he never was by himself. He's traveling with his disciples and, and they all, you know, hear this and no doubt they turn around and this guy is just yelling. And the Bible says he comes all the way. He who was once afar off, now all the way back, comes to the feet of Jesus and he puts himself right there, shouting. Why wouldn't he, by the way? What would you do? You think you'd be doing a little dance? You think you'd be excited? I mean, this would be the best day of your life. That death that was on the horizon, that ugly suffering that was ahead of you, it's gone. 
As you're clean, you're healed. Life's given and restored. Of course you'd scream and shout and praise God. I wonder today, why do we lose that? Do you remember the day that you were healed by Jesus? I'm talking about in your soul. Do you remember the day you came to him with a burden of sin? Where you saw your stinking sinful soul as it is in truth. And that day when you saw that he had died for you, and maybe there were some tears, thinking it was your sin that put him there. And maybe you thought and you considered how he rose again and, and you heard the offer, all who come to me, I'll in no wise cast out. And, and you realized, whosoever will can take of the water of life freely. And, and you call on Jesus and the, the peace of God floods the soul. And the joy of the Lord comes in. And what do you want to do? You want to tell others, right? You want to give thanks to God. You get that hymnal and, and you start singing those songs. Then sings, my soul, my Savior God, to thee, how great thou art. And you know, you sing it whether you can sing or not. Because it's real. And you just want to shout. Doesn't it tell us in the Thanksgiving psalm, make a joyful noise unto the Lord? What does that sound like? <laughs> when I was a boy, I used to, play baseball all by myself. That's hard to do, but it's the only way to make sure the Cubs always win. <laughs> and so I'd have these whole games played out in my mind, and I'd be down in the field, and my sister Kara's here for Thanksgiving. She probably remembers it, and I'd throw the ball up, and I'd swing that bat at it and hit it. And if Ryan Sandberg was up, I mean, it, was, it never counted until it was over the wall. You know, I mean, I'm always trying to hit it. And if you came down there to where I was playing and you got around me, sometimes you might hear a little bit more than, than just things going on in my head. And, and once in a while, when I really hit it well, I would make a sound and it went like this. Ah. <laughs> Say, what's that all about? It's the crowd. It's the crowd. And when the home run goes and you're watching on TV, right, that's all you hear. You don't hear like any sort of, uh, of, of words being said. You just hear the, the shout, the joyful noise. The home run's been hit. And so it is, I can only imagine the day when Jesus walks through the gates of Jerusalem. You want to talk about a joyful noise. And for all of us who are the redeemed... I tell you, there's going to be just a lot of, ah. You know, it ought to grip our hearts now. What's Thanksgiving Day? Make a joyful noise. Make a joyful noise. He fell on his face at Jesus' feet. The Bible tells us in verse number 16, right at his feet. And there he gave him thanks. We see the giving of thanks to God, that act of worship, and it's only fitting we place ourselves right at His feet. There alone at the feet of the Master is a fitting place for the redeemed of the Lord to be. Again, I could ask you, did this, this leper have, is this just motions that he's going through? Is this ritual? No, it's all spontaneous because of a heart of thanksgiving. That's what I'm saying. The heart of thanksgiving is the heart of worship. The heart of thanksgiving is the one that's able to live that life of a living sacrifice. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the what? The mercies of God. Don't forget the mercies of God. Because it's then, as, we, as he beseeches us by the mercies of God, that we present our bodies as what? A living sacrifice. The heart of thanksgiving that we see in the passage, there's a contrast because it was only one. Again, it's startling. Jesus asked the question in verse 17, were there not ten cleansed? But where are the nine? Where's the nine? Again, we're told in verse number 16, the one that came back was a Samaritan. This also stands out. 
those that you would expect to be most thankful, those that you would think would be ready and eager to return and give thanks, those who should have been closest to God and, and had so many of the resources of God and been looking for the Messiah, the Messiah, they never came back. There's no record of them of ever saying thanks. I believe that's a grave warning to American Christians. How much we've been given. I've read that only one in 20 Christians worldwide have an entire copy of the Word of God. 5%. How many Bibles have you had in your lifetime? We've got Bibles in here today and to spare. Are we grateful? I've seen Chinese Christians get their first copy of the Bible smuggled into them and take a Bible and hold it and cry and rejoice and open that book and just start devouring it. Oh, we let it sit on the shelf and collect dust. If all we did was hear just Bible reading, we'd say, well, that's boring. What's wrong with us? The American Christian is one who has such a unique experience. So many Christians throughout time have endured much suffering and persecution. But we meet here today side by side without fear of human retribution or any physical threat. And though most Christians have so little we live in historic peace, and as Americans, we live in luxury. And yet I feel like American Christians are the most unthankful. One thing that's always stood out to me as I go to the mission field is the joy and gratitude of the Christians in third world places. What's going on? Again, Jesus asked the question, were there not ten cleansed? Where are the nine? I was told of an axiom while I was growing up that in a typical church, 10% of the people do 90% of the work. Now, I'm thankful. I, I don't believe that's true in our church's case. But it ought to be 100% of the people. Why aren't others demonstrating thanksgiving? Why aren't others returning into the work to give glory to God? Where's the other nine? Remember the searching words of our Savior where he said, the laborers are few. Few. How few return and give true thanks in a life of service, which is our reasonable service. Maybe the other nine thought about coming to Jesus at another time. Trouble was, he was just passing by. The time was now. And they did not take that opportunity. I believe the other nine did not return, and it will be on this screen, because they were so caught up in the gift, they did not recognize and honor the giver. It's a sure path to the pig pen. When we get so caught up in the gifts, the gifts of God. And you can tell when you are caught up with the gifts of God, and not the giver of the gifts, when you complain and bellyache when the gifts are taken away. We see in Job's life, when he lost everything, here's a man of great faith, because he said, the Lord gave, and the Lord's taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Who's the source of every good and perfect gift? It's God. When we lose those gifts, and, and you know, we, we, we can, again, maybe it's something financially that we've enjoyed, but now we don't have it. Uh, maybe it's something health-wise that we've had, but now we don't have it. Maybe it's in relationships that we've had, and now we don't have it. And we complain, and we criticize. It's because we're not caught up with the giver, because the giver's still there, the giver's still good. The giver is the one we should have been caught up with all along. I remember in my life as a boy growing up, and maybe you've had this same experience, that I didn't care so much about the giver at Christmas. It was the gift. And I think there were probably times in my life where I was kind of a stinker, 
and gross because I wasn't real thankful for the gift. Just, eh. You know, one day I grew up a little bit, and now at Christmas time, I get gifts. Sometimes those gifts are, are really nice gifts. I'm thankful for that. But really, it's not so much the gift anymore. What excites me is who's giving me a gift. It's the giver. You know this as a parent. When you get a gift from your child, even when they're little, right? When they're little, and maybe the gift they're bringing you is kind of gross. (laughs) Breakfast in bed. Oh, thanks. I wanted soggy toast, you know. Some of this already taste tested. You don't really want that, but it's, you see the child in their gift and they're expressing love and it's all about the giver. And that's what it must be for us. These ten, these nine did not return and give thanks because they're caught up with the gift. Again, we see only one in this passage exalted Jesus. Only one ended up sent out by his master. Ten had called him Jesus. Ten called him master. Ten healed by his grace. But only one placed himself at the feet of the Lord in worship and humble submission, giving thanks. And reminds of the words of our Savior, this people honoreth me with their lips, but their hearts far from me. They could ask, I'm sure you could ask those nine, were you thankful? And they would say, oh, yes. But we read the story. Were they thankful? Oh no. Not in truth. Only one. So that brings us to the final point, final thoughts, and that's just some considerations I want to go through rather quickly. What causes such ingratitude? One commentator lists this. I think we get to a place of ingratitude through callousness, Pride, selfishness, thoughtlessness, cowardice, weakness, procrastination, worldliness. I think the thing that stood out to me the most is I feel like we get to that place when we lose our first love. Again, we see the leper in the moment, and, and we, can, we can identify with the moment when we're cleansed, when we have the promise of eternal life, and that, that load of sin is lifted off of us, and, and we, we have that peace sweeping our souls. We can identify with that shout and, and that rejoicing that's there. That's what we call the first love in the book of Revelation, is it not? And we're ready to tell others, and we're ready to do anything for the one who saved us. So then we lose that gratitude. I think it's because we left that first love. It happens in marriages. Fall out of love, will people stop being thankful? Yeah, she made dinner, but she always does. Are we still thankful? Yeah, he filled up the car with gas, but that's his job. Be thankful, people. Be thankful to your God. We're out of the will of God when we're not giving thanks. Second thing, I want you to note this, and there's going to be something on the screen, but it's going to be missing the main thrust. I'm going to tell that to you directly. Bitterness for a child of God is unacceptable. Murmuring and disputing is unacceptable. What do we have to complain about? Such things are not fit to be on the tongues of the redeemed of the Lord. But there's something else that's unacceptable for a child of God. Silence. It's unacceptable to not give thanks, to not be part of the joyful shout, to not sing and give praise to our God. It's unacceptable. I hope you see that in this story. A third thing in consideration is this. Thanksgiving involves more than just the lips. It involves your life. We often talk about that this time of year. More than thanksgiving is thanks living. You think of this leper and you think of what brought him to give thanks. Again, what is it for us? It's for that day 
when we met Jesus. The Word of God says, 1 Corinthians 15, 57, Thanks be to God, which giveth us the victory. 2 Corinthians 2, 14, Now thanks be unto God, which always causes us to triumph in Christ. 2 Corinthians 9, 15, Thanks be unto God for His unspeakable gift. Ephesians 5.20, giving thanks always for all things unto God and the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, so that we should say with David, I'll bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. My soul shall make her boast in the Lord. Oh, magnify the Lord with me and let us exalt his name together. Wilt thou not revive us again, O Lord, that thy people may rejoice in thee. We need that revival. Today I'm asking, is your life like the nine or like the one? What does your lips reveal? What's on your heart? We come in and we get to open the hymnal and sing these songs. Heaven came down and glory filled my soul. How can we sing that and not have gratitude and thanksgiving be leading the joy in our heart. Are we a thankful people? Let's pray. Father, I come to you today. I thank you for the opportunity to be in your word. I pray you'd bless it. Lord, I ask that this word today would reprove, rebuke, exhort, encourage, admonish, direct, reveal, Lord, may we be a thankful people. We had a day, Lord, as your people where we met Jesus and everything changed. And Lord, our best is yet to come. You've given us so much. Though we had nothing materially, Lord, we have everything in you. Join heirs with Christ, citizens of a heavenly kingdom, an inheritance incorruptible and fades not away. Father, help us get caught up in how blessed we are and never get over it. Forgive us, Lord, for our grumbling, our complaining, our unthankfulness, our ingratitude. Forgive us, Lord, for our covetous hearts. Lord, help us to be back at that place in our first love, crying out, thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Lord, if there's one in our midst today that doesn't know you, I pray, Father, speak to them, show them their need to be saved. Do it, I pray, by your grace, for your glory. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.